So appreciate you guys coming, uh, both both online um, as well as in person. A um, couple things just to cover with you guys based on the previous game. Um, you know, we won the turnover battle. We talk about the most important stats that we study each week. We won the penalty battle, uh, not necessarily in the number of penalties, but yards. But you didn't necessarily feel that way to me, but it did play out that way. Drive start battle, we won sack battle, and we won the explosive play battle. Um, we did not reach our goal, um, you know, on offense, but we did. But we did win the overall battle. When you talk about players of the game uh, on offense, we had Katron Allen. Uh, and Nicholas Singleton as the, the players of the game. On defense, we went with the defensive line, uh, Kozaya, Izard, Beeman, Durant, Elise, Mustafer, Tarburton, Isaac, Vanover, and Robinson, and Dennis Sutton. Obviously, when you break the all-time tackles for a loss record uh, at Penn State, it's hard not to, to make sure that you give those guys some love. They earned it and deserved it. On special teams, uh, Jake Pinnaker, you know, Jake Pinnaker. So, uh, those were the players of the game. And then the D-Squad players of the game. Uh, on offense, um, we had Caden Saunders, Jim Fitzgerald. On defense, we had Devon Townley and Keon Wiley. And then on special teams, Jace Tuddy. Um, you talk about general positives. Uh, I thought the kickoffs and field goals, you know, we were 7 of 7 uh, when it comes to either extra points or field goals. Number 12 was going to be a factor in the game, so we really were able to limit his impact as a kickoff returner. Uh, I thought we had a ton of guys at this time of the year. It's just kind of the nature of, of football. We've got a bunch of guys with bumps and bruises or sprains, and we've got a bunch of guys that really have battled through that. Um, and you know, I wanted to make sure you know, that we made a big deal out of that because it's been pretty impressive uh, from the coaches' staff. I thought our next man in mentality was really good, which we needed it. We already talked about six sacks and 16 tackles for a loss. One and oh mentality, moving on, controlling the things that we can control. Our sudden change defense has been really impressive all season. I think we're 70 percent. Um, 70 percent, seven out of 10 drives have resulted in zero points. And some of those, as you guys know, those sudden change situations have been backed up in our own territory. So that's been really big. And then conversely, our backed up offense has been really good. 67% of our drives starting inside the 10 yard line have gone for at least two first downs, which has allowed us to flip the field. So those have been real positives. And I thought we made a big improvement on third down. We jumped 11% um, over the last two games in third down efficiency. Opportunities for growth, we got to continue to emphasize start fast, and then we got to eliminate the pre snap and the post snap penalties. One last thing that I thought I would share with you because I thought it was interesting, and I hope you guys do, uh, from the Indiana game. It was towards the end of the game, and I don't remember it specifically. It may have been during a timeout or, or something, but towards the end of the game. And the chain, uh, the chain. Uh, gang guy was was talking to me and, and typically you guys don't get to know those personalities they're pretty much the same guys just like here at Penn State we've had guys that have probably been doing it for 30 years and this guy's trying to talk to me and he's saying you know that you know what's funny and I'm, I'm kind of giving him that like body language demeanor like I really don't want to get into a conversation with you um, you know during the game um, but he doesn't read my body language and he says it again you know what's really funny and I, and I kind of turn, and he goes, you know, I'm a, I'm a pastor of a church. So now I have to listen, right? Um, he goes, I'm a pastor of a church, and two years ago you were here, and you were talking on the sideline about don't score, don't score, don't score. And I've never heard a coach in 30 years talk about not scoring. And then when you go on the field, you're screaming, don't score, don't score, don't score. Um, and then you scored, and obviously you know how it plays out uh, over time and, and how the game plays out. And he goes, but I've used that in my sermon I don't know how many times. And I'm like, I still don't really understand what he's talking about. <laughs> and what he says is what, what, what may look good in this moment may not be the right thing for you, you know, down the road. So finally, kind of the message kind of comes 
Um, you know, but it was just an interesting interaction after all these years. I've never really had that kind of conversation and during the game. Um, but, um, but it was an interesting interaction that I had with this gentleman on the sideline uh, talking about a situation that I really didn't really want to talk about or remember, but he did bring it up and had a message about how he's used it in his church. Um, moving on to Maryland. Um, obviously, you guys know I've known Mike Loxley for a long time. We've been on the same staff at the University of Maryland for a number of years. Um, he's done a really good job there of improving their program and, and their roster. Uh, their offensive coordinator, Dan Enos. Um, I don't know Dan as well, but obviously he's got a tremendous resume, five years of head coaching experience, uh, 11 years of offensive coordinator experience. Uh, and has really done a nice job there you know, with their offense. Obviously, it's a combination of him and Mike Loxley, uh, but has done a nice job. You know, players on offense, they got a running back that we got a ton of respect for, redshirt freshman Roman Hemby, um, who's a local kid for them. Uh, Antoine Little, Littleton uh, is a big back, uh, six foot, 235 pounds. There's reports out there that at one point he was 290 or 265. He's lost a ton of weight and has been very productive for them. Rakim uh, Jarrett is obviously a guy that we recruited, was a highly, highly recruited young man. Um, and then uh, Talia, I think everybody knows kind of his story, transfer from, from Alabama, and it seems like he's been playing there for a long time and has done a really good job for them. And then we've been impressed with Delmar uh, Glaze, an offensive tackle, the right tackle number 74, and then a tight end from Pennsylvania, uh, C.J. Dupree. So those guys jump out. On defense, Brian Williams is a guy I've known for a long time, their defense coordinator. I think he's doing a really good job. He was the defensive coordinator at Godby High School. When I was at Vanderbilt, we went in there and recruited an awesome young man by the name of Chikari Thomas, um, who played who played for Coach Williams at Godby High School. Um, and I think, uh, I think Brian Williams is doing a really good job with their defense right now. Guys that kind of stand out to us um, is their defensive tackle, number 33. Uh, Nasili uh, Kite, um, cornerback number two, uh, Chikorian Bennett, um, who I actually think played junior college football with Mitch Tinsley, if I'm remembering that correctly. Um, middle linebacker number one, Jay Sean Barham, is a young man that we recruited very hard. He uh, was playing really well for them as a true freshman. And then defensive tackle number 54, uh, Almi Finau, as a defensive tackle. And then on special teams, uh, James Thomas, um, guys that stand out for us you know, on special teams. James has been on the staff there, was an analyst that got promoted from within, has done a nice job. Uh, their punt returner, Tarheeb Still, who's a local kid from New Jersey. Uh, kick returner number 15, Octavian Smith. And then they have a kicker that I think transferred in, but he's a Pennsylvania kid from Lebanon, Pennsylvania who transferred in is doing a really nice job for him. So uh, that's my overall notes. Uh, happy and, and looking forward to opening up the questions. Go to Rich Scarcella, Renny Eagle, and then we'll go to Mike Rose. Hey, Rich. I'm having a hard time hearing you. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes, sir. OK. How, how are you doing? Good, how are you? I'm really good, thanks. Um, I'd like to ask you a two-part question about uh, the offensive line. Well, on a hunting motion decision this morning or announced this morning about returning for 2023. Um, what kind of boost is that for next year and how has he played? And also, can you give us any update on Olu and Landon in their forms? Yeah, so uh, the first part about Hunter. Um, as you know, I think I may have mentioned it, but I think you know I've been having these meetings um, on Sundays, especially Sundays at home games when a lot of the families are in town anyway, um, sitting down and talking. So I had a meeting with Hunter and his mom and his sister uh, a few weeks back and had a really good conversation. And I was sitting in my office, I think it was yesterday, and he just came walking in and had a couple questions for me, wanted to ask me. Um, and at the end of the conversation, he said, you know, I, I'm staying. Um, I think there's a lot of things that, that, that I want to do here at Penn State and I want to finish in my career. Uh, you know, I think the other thing is he's going to finish his master's degree, which is, which is awesome. Um, 
you know, and I think you know he's got really high expectations of what he can do and we can do. So I think that'll be great. Uh, but that's that's really all it was. He's obviously we've had a conversation. He's been getting asked a question, so he just kind of wanted to you know answer the question and then be able to kind of move on and not not be you know continue to get asked the question for the rest of the season. Um, Landon. Uh, Landon, I did speak with Landon. As you guys know, I won't really call and talk about injuries unless I've talked to the young men first about it. Landon did have surgery uh, and will be out for the remainder of the year. Um, and, and Olu is one of those situations where it's week to week, and uh, I won't I won't get into the kind of the details and specifics of that. I think you know, like especially for the for the uh, media that has been covering us you know, for a while and consistently and regularly know, know how we handle those things. But, uh, but Landon, Landon will be done for the year. Mike Gross, Lancaster Newspapers, then Donnie Collins. Hey, Mike. Hey, James, how are you? Good, how are you? I'm good, thanks. A uh, couple of things about Katron and Nick. Um, it, it, it looks to me like the last couple of weeks in particular, Nick, has improved in some of the areas that Katron was really good at almost from the jump, uh, making people miss and vision and, and using your blockers, et cetera. Uh, so uh, do you agree with that? And if so, is the explanation just more reps or, or something other than that? And then the other thing is people talk about freshmen hitting the wall around this time of year. And do you think that's a real thing? And if it is, doesn't seem to be bothering them. Uh, so, uh, can you mitigate? Is there anything you can do about it? Yeah. So, first of all, I don't know if I would make the comparison the way you did, but to answer part of your question, yeah, I think Nick is getting better every single week. I think both of those guys are running really physical, and and Nick had some really good runs where you know maybe there was three or four yards, and he turned them into six or seven yard runs. Um, but yeah, he's getting more comfortable and getting more confident every single week, um, every single practice, every single game. Uh, and so is Katron. They're, they're both getting better in, in areas that they need to improve. And as you can imagine, there's still a ton of growth for both of them um, you know, based on the fact that they're true freshmen and, and haven't played a whole lot of football. You know, back to your other point about you know, young players you know, hitting the wall, I think, you know, that's that's where kind of the rotation is important. So hopefully, you know, getting Keevon back, you know, would help with that. Um, but being able to rotate two backs, it kind of limits that, um, you know. Uh, but yeah, I think, you know, it's, it's a factor, there's no doubt about it. But I do think if you're playing with one guy all the time, then the likelihood of that happening kind of increases and, and we're not doing that. Now, I also know, if they're not on the field, then then you guys are going to be asking me tough questions about why they're they're not on the field. Uh, but then now I can use your um, hitting the freshman wall uh, example, mitigating that is the reason why. So I appreciate you asking. Donnie Collins, Grand Times Tribune, then Corey Geiger. How you doing, James? Good. How are you? Doing well. Uh, kickoffs and kickoff placement were kind of a topic of discussion in the first half of the season, and then Jake is obviously settled that down a little bit. Uh, why did you guys put him in when you did uh, on kickoffs? How has he improved there? And is this something you, because his percentage is pretty high on, on touchbacks. Is this something you guys knew he could do uh, for the past couple of years? And it, or, or how has he improved there in, in, in that regard? Yeah, he, he's doing really well. And I appreciate you bringing it up. Yeah, he's, he's doing really well. I think, you know, like I mentioned in the beginning, I thought that was a big factor in the game. You know, number 12, as you guys know, their head coach was talking about him all week long and the impact that he could have on the game and trying to get him touches. So being able to kick it out. It's funny, I was talking to Jake a couple times after his kicks when I kind of jogged down and kind of congratulated him on doing a good job. I guess number 12 was like talking trash to him the whole time, like kick it to me, you know, kick it to me. You're scared to kick it to me to go back and forth. Um, so I think that was a major factor. You know, it's interesting. You know, with, with Jake, early on, um, when he was focused on, on field goals only, he was not great at kickoff, and we were trying to get him uh, to do both. And I know he's got aspirations, like all these guys do, to continue playing. 
and most of those guys are going to have to do two jobs, whether it's field goal and kickoff or punt and kickoff. You got you got to try to bring a little bit more value there. Um, and he really embraced it and worked like crazy in the offseason. Obviously, with Stout going, because Stout was elite at that. With Stout moving on, there was an opportunity and a need there. We'd like to specialize, you know, whenever we can, but it just was obvious that, that Jay could handle both and, and has done a really nice job in both areas. But you would not have said that, you know, two, three years ago. He's really worked hard at it and gotten good at it. Corey Geiger, DK Pittsburgh Sports, then Ben Jones. Hi, James. Oh, you? Did you have a chance to go 10-2? Does he have a southern accent right now? He does. He always does. does. Oh, yeah, oh, he always does? We're from, from Arkansas. From Arkansas. Oh, I didn't know that. It just seemed extra strong <laughs> right there. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, you have a chance to go 10-2 and two and get to a New Year's Six game. Uh, a strong case could probably be made that your team is even better than maybe people think. But at the same time, you don't have what people would consider a signature win yet. So I'm curious as a coach, what you think about the concept of the signature win and how the public latches onto that kind of thing when they're evaluating a team. Yeah, I, obviously there, there's value in it, right? It's interesting because you got some teams and some programs um, that have not been consistent but have big time wins. Um, and then you have others that have been consistent but but not the signature win. And obviously what you want is you want both, right? You want, you want the consistency week in and week out, which I think we've all seen um, you know, is hard to do. And the signature wins are, are hard to do. And what you're trying to do is, is try to do both. You know, that's, that's what the, the, you know, the best programs in college football are able to do. Um, I, I don't know if I would necessarily say consistently, but yes, that's what the best programs in college football are attempting to do. Um, so yeah, I think it's I think it's a fair point. Obviously, we want the same thing, um, you know. But most importantly, you know, we got to be one and zero this week, or people will be complaining about the other part of it too. So we just we, we got to do what we got to do this week to be one and zero. Continue to stack wins and stack days and, and be positive. Give you guys positive things to write about, and then hopefully at the end of the season we're where we need to be and put ourselves in the best position possibly uh, for the bowl season as well as momentum going into the next season. But yeah, I think obviously you, know, you want both. Ben Jones, statecollege.com, then Johnny McGonagall. Hey James, how's it going? Good, how are you, Ben? Yeah, my power went out in the middle of all this, so I'm on my back, it's very exciting. Uh, it, actually, it actually just broke up while you were saying that. <laughs> all right, well, we'll see if this question's any good gets to you. But um, Christian Bayou. How is he sort of handled this season? I would say it's sort of unique because I think there's a certain amount of telegraphing about how this ought to all pan out in the end. And certainly maybe the conversations in the last building are different than the ones that, that seem to be going on in front of everybody else. But how does he handle this? How do you handle that? And how do you sort of prepare for whatever happens over the next couple months? Yeah, he's been phenomenal. He really has. I think that whole quarterback room has been great. I think Sean has kind of set the tone for that that whole room. Uh, but but Christian has been phenomenal. You know, those, those are tough conversations and tough decisions that have to be made. Um, you know, it, it's interesting because I've, I've I've kind of used this with the players before. You know, you look at some players that may play as a true freshman and play well, and another guy redshirts and they're in the same class. And then you look three years down the road and the guy that redshirted ends up having what people would describe as maybe a better career. So it's just, you know, there's a lot of twists and turns along these journeys. Um, but I think, I think Vayer has been phenomenal. His attitude has been great. He's been great in meetings. He's totally engaged. We've been rotating those guys down to the scout team. They've been awesome down there. Um, he's been great. His body language, his demeanor, his leadership, his attention to detail, the way he's preparing as if he was the starter has been really good. So, um, you know, th those types of things, specifically at those positions, I think are really important. So, you know, we'll, we'll see how this all plays out. But, uh, you know, I hope he, he stays at Penn State and continues to chase his dream and, and gets his degree and, and see how it all plays out because again there's a lot of twists and turns along these journeys um, 
and you know, and it, there's a part of me that that it breaks my heart a little bit about the conversations and things that you're having now in college football that you didn't used to have. But I also, as you guys know, I also, you know, understand this is where we're at and kind of embrace it. And there's really, there's there's good in both, right? There's good, so there's a lot of good things that I believe existed in the old model. And there's a lot of good that exists in the new model. Um, I don't know if they're necessarily the same things though. Johnny McGonagall, Penn Live, and then we'll come into the room. Hey, James, how are you? Good, how are you? Good. Uh, you know, going back to Landon, but before the injury, uh, how would you evaluate how he developed, uh, you know, from spring into camp and then into those five games uh, that he started at guard? Yeah, he's playing really well. As you know, you know, Landon is, seems like he's been a part of our program forever. You know, he's looked just like he looks right now since, like, third grade when he first started coming to camp at Penn State. Um, he made it pretty obvious that this is where he always wanted to be. Um, he was great during the recruiting process. He was, he was high production and low maintenance, and you can't have enough of those guys in your organization, whether that's players or staff. And, um, and he's been productive. I mean, you think about him, he's, he's started and played well at guard, well enough for us to win. He started and played at tackle, well enough for us to win. Um, He's been a great teammate. He's been a great student. He's been a class act both on and off the field. I think he's got a very, very bright future. You know, obviously, you, you hate these types of setbacks and, and disappointment. It is part of the game. Um, we do seem to have a little bit more of them you know, right now than, than we've had maybe in, in, in other years. Maybe in other years we've had them you know, at certain positions with certain players that have, that have made it maybe a little bit more attention on it. Um, but but we seem to have a number of these right now. And, uh, Landon's, Landon's attitude has been, been phenomenal and the team's attitude about next man in has been really good. I do think, I remember talking to Trout and Frank Leonard, you know, it happening, you know, in pregame right before the game. I do think that that was something that we needed to learn from that something like this may happen and we got to respond and respond quickly and I don't know if we necessarily did with his initially. Mark? James, you've been down three starters on the O-line and some guys further down the depth chart have been banged up as well. Can you address the job that Phil has done kind of juggling all of the different pieces to actually field a line and not only field a line but have a productive line in the last couple of games? Yeah, I think it's it's probably been you know, understated you know, by me. Um, and part of that is, is strategy a little bit, um, you know, with, with who we're playing and them knowing exactly what we're doing. Um, that's played a that's played a part in it. Um, but yeah, I think he's he's done a phenomenal job. You know, Phil's done a great job. Frank's done a great job. I think Mike has done a really good job in the way he's called the game and understand there's some things that we got to do going in the last week where we're going to have to tweak and change how we call the game to, to put those guys in the best position as possible, whether that's running the ball a little bit more, whether that is moving the pocket a little bit more, excuse me, <clears throat> whether that is uh, chipping, you know, with tight ends and, and running backs to, to try to help those guys, uh, all, all those types of things, max protect, whatever, whatever it may be. But yeah, I think, I think we've done a nice job under, under you know, really challenging circumstances. Um, you know, starting a true freshman, you know, in the Big Ten, um, you know, at left tackle, um, you know, I think it's a lot of credit to, to the staff. I think it's a lot of credit to the players. I thought Olu did a really good job being the left tackle coach last week. Um, I thought Drew Shelton has really prepared all season. He's another one of those freshmen in this class that I've talked to you guys about that has been very intentional about how he's worked, been very mature. Um, you know, and, and really from a very early point when he arrived on campus, we, we thought he had a chance to be pretty good. So we'll, we'll see how it all plays out. You know, we're, we're hopeful that we'll have Caden back this week, which, which would really help. Uh, but we'll, we'll see how those things play out. At the end of the day, we're going to do whatever we've got to do to, to be 1-0 and this week. Um, but there's still the possibility of us be, maybe being able to redshirt some of these guys if we can. But that won't trump what we have to do this year and this season to, to be successful. Sorry. James, how are you? Good, how are you? Doing good, thanks. 
Uh, you mentioned, obviously, Landon, after the year, we've seen Hunter get banged up, we've seen Sal get banged up, and you just mentioned, you know, redshirting everything. How does Landon's injury and those guys being banged up impact guys like Vega and JP the rest of the way? Yeah, so, so Vega's a guy that we are preparing in practice every single week to play. Um, you know, uh, JB's a guy that we're preparing. You know, JB's a guy that we're not only preparing at left guard, we're also preparing at left tackle. We played tackle in, in high school. Um, you know, so we did that all last week as well. Obviously getting Caden back helps. You know, and then, and then there's also, you know, the discussion about how many games left do they have available? So that do you play Vega now this week to get him one game and then shut somebody else down and try to manage it as much as you can again, but not so much so that it, it limits your ability to be effective and explosive and, and, and you know be one and oh. So so we'll see how that plays out this week. Um, you know, we thought we were gonna have Caden back for last week, didn't play out that way, so you never Totally know. Um, you know what you're trying to do is preparing for worst case scenario and and hoping for you know, slightly above that, if not best case scenario. Nope. Hey James, how are you? Sorry. Hey James, I want to ask you, um, how did you and the staff this um, I guess this week um, approach voting with the um, players? And is there anything that's built in the schedule today to um, give them the opportunity to do so if they haven't already? No, we, we promoted it, not just, you know, this week, but really for the last couple weeks, uh, you know, we've talked about the importance of it and getting out and doing it. Um, I know, you know, in years past, uh, there was some conversation about shutting this day down. And, you know, I think once everybody kind of looked at it, it, it didn't totally make sense. As you know, you have from 7 in the morning till 8 at night. So there's time to do it. Um, I'm actually going after, after this. We have a staff meeting morning seven so it's, it's hard to do it then uh, but I'm, I'm going to go after this and do it my wife already went this morning uh, so just promote it as much as we can the importance of it um, for whatever your beliefs are for where, whatever you stand on things that you know um, you know people have lost their lives and made tremendous sacrifices for you to have the ability to, to vote um, and not to take that right for granted so we just we talk about it as much as we can as we do a lot of social issues um, and promote it, you know. At, but at the end of the day, you gotta you gotta be willing to go do it. Thanks. Afternoon, James. How are we doing? Doing good. Um, you touched on Drew Sheldon a little bit uh, a couple of questions ago, but what have you seen from him specifically in practice to kind of know that you have a, a true freshman who's ready to start at left tackle in the Big Ten? What were you seeing uh, out of him over these past few weeks? Well, he's a unique, like, COVID recruiting story. You know, um, literally, I think one of the first tape we got on him was him blocking his sister in the backyard. Um, you know, didn't have tape. He's got a sister who's tall. I think she's actually got a volleyball scholarship. Um, and literally, he's in the backyard pass setting, you know, with, with his sister. And she won a few reps, to be honest. <laughs> um, but that was kind of one of them weird COVID deals where you're trying to get information and um, you know it kind of went from there but then afterwards you know um, he ended up transferring high schools and then transferring back and you know, we had a really strong relationship with his mom and his sister um, and we were able to kind of weather you know that storm of the recruiting process and then from that point on he's been been phenomenal. He, uh, our strength coaches very early on had identified him as a guy they were really excited about in terms of his work ethic and demeanor and approach. Um, the veteran players were kind of talking about him. The coaches, once we were able to get in the training camp and start meeting with him and teaching football, he's a smart guy, he's a mature guy. You know, so he's been preparing all season kind of for his opportunity and, you know, there's been a lot of discussions in college football over the years about just going to a five-year model where everybody just has five years. And if he was, you know, he would have played a ton already this year. Um, you know, so we'll, we'll, we'll see how it all plays out. But he just, he's a guy that checks a lot of boxes in terms of intelligence and maturity and athleticism and body type. And his high school down in town here in Pennsylvania did a great job with him. 
Uh, he spent some time at IMG. They did a nice job of him as well. Um, but you know, he's just he's been a guy that's you know really been kind of steady, steady and consistent the entire time. And um, you know, I think it's he's got a really high ceiling okay. and, a, and a low and a high floor to be honest with you. DJ, that's my hometown. You're shouting out there, downtown. Where'd you go to high school? Downtown is the other one. Um, but going along with all the injuries and the contingency plans that you guys have had, Kobe King played a really nice game on Saturday. Um, how do you think maybe that can help propel him forward, and do you hope that maybe you'll have Curtis and Elston this week, or either of them? Yeah, so um, so when it comes to Kobe, you know, really good. He's been playing all year long. Um, he's getting more and more consistent each week. He's making you know, a few more splash plays every single week. And then obviously you know, we were in a situation a few times on, on Saturday, not for the whole game, but, but kind of some spurts of you know, series or time where you know, he, was, he was the guy um, and really did some good things to the point where the staff is, is really excited about him and his future. Um, but I do think, you know, to your point, those reps, though, that experience uh, is valuable. There's always some growing pains with those guys, especially when you're the quarterback of the defense. And, and, and typically, if you make a mistake at D-tackle, that's one thing. But if you make a mistake at linebacker, whether it's setting the defense or fitting the wrong gap or, or, or not playing man coverage or, you know, whether we're, we're playing one hole and you're the whole defender on the crossing route or whatever it may be, the issue is magnified because of the position you play. Um, but you know, each week it seems like you know, those uh, mistakes and those things that he needs to learn through experience, that, that you know, those plays are, are getting less and less each week. So hopefully last week there was a ton of growth and, and uh, you know, opportunity to take the next step not only you know from a production standpoint but also just in terms of you know, leading and running the defense so uh, excited to see what he does this week mark james uh, chop has been a productive player for you all season but he didn't have the sack numbers he got home once and it looked like he could have had a second sack uh saturday where have you seen him kind of improve over, over the course of the season and are those sack numbers always indicative of how well uh defensive end is playing yeah it's funny not only whether it's fans or media, but really even on my staff, right away people want to jump to, well, how many sacks do you have, you know? And there's a lot more um, to playing defensive end, you know, within the system uh, that we run than just sacks. But don't get me wrong, you know, we, we want as many sacks as possible, but, but pressures are also really important. Batted down passes are really important. Tackles for loss are really important. Uh, consistently holding your gap um, or penetrating your gap is, is, is really important. Uh, and we've been pleased with them. I think part of it too is, you know, he missed some time from an injury. So, you know, I think he's one of those guys which we deal with a decent amount, guys that really have never been injured before and how to handle that, be able to come back from it, not only physically, but also mentally. Um, so he'll be, he'll be better, you know, for going through these experiences. And uh, we think he's playing really well. Very, very pleased with him. I think you know he's been disruptive uh, in both the run and pass, even when it hasn't always showed up in the stat sheet. But you know, no different than we were talking about whether it was consistency or signature you know, type wins. It's the same deal, right? You want both. You want the consistent play and being disruptive with the with the pressures and tackles for loss, but also with the sacks, and, and he's capable of doing that. All right. Last question. Hey James, um, you said earlier in the offseason that you guys were felt more comfortable with the amount of depth that you had at more positions this year than last year. And as guys have started to get banged up and the season has progressed, how do you feel that kind of the depth players have been stepping up um, and making an impact in the games versus uh, last year? Yeah, we, we've needed that. Um, it, was a, it was a point of emphasis. I think we talked about this last week as well, um, that – not only did I think we did a better job of playing guys and developing guys and getting more uh, depth that was already currently in the roster, but then also there just seems to be more guys in this freshman class that, that have been ready to play. Um, you know, when you, when you think about some of the guys and, and what this freshman class has, has been able to do, 
you know, whether it's a, an Abdul or whether it's a Zane or whether it's a Denai. You know, Zane's a guy that you know, not a lot of people are talking about, but you know, we think he's doing some really good things and, and really excited about him and his future. You know, Denai, obviously, the defensive end has an interception and he's been you know, getting more and more reps and more production. And then, obviously, a left tackle. Um, you know, in, in terms of what we just got done discussing, two tailbacks, um, you know, quarterback that's that's getting significant reps as a, as a backup. There's just been a bunch of examples of young guys playing. And then there's another group of guys that are close that you guys don't get to see in, in practice every single day. So I think it's been good, but obviously it's been it's been needed as well. And you know, that's. I think that's also a major differentiator in, in college football is, is depth because you know you're you're going to deal with it everybody is and and your second line players and your third line players better be good enough to win, you know, in the Big Ten with and, and beyond. Thank you, Coach. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Thank you.